Coming of Age is coming up next. I'm your host, Emily Echeverria. First today, we're talking to Dr. Ivan Elias about the risks and treatment for colorectal cancer. Next up, we've got information on ACTS2, an organization offering caregiver support resources for those caring for adults with dementia, with particular focus on African-American caregivers. And finally, we're celebrating National Social Work Month and showcasing the efforts of these tireless advocates and their life-changing work. Stay with us. Coming of age starts right now. As we age, staying active in life and involved in the community can become a challenge. But with Council on Aging of West Florida's wide range of home-based services, you remain healthy, independent, and engaged. From Meals on Wheels and respite care to senior dining sites and the retreat, you'll find the support and connection that you need to age well. Aging looks different for everyone, and we're here to help you meet your needs and thrive while maintaining what makes you, you. We've been in the community since 1972, advocating for elders and supporting those who care for our parents and grandparents. Now, join us as we discuss the age-related issues that matter to you. President Clinton dedicated March as National Colon Cancer Awareness Month in February of 2000. Colon cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States for men and women. And many colorectal cancers can be prevented if they are detected early, when they're easier to treat, which is why screenings are so important. Here to talk to us today about the signs, symptoms, and treatments of colon cancer is Dr. Ivan Elias, a gastroenterologist from Baptist Medical Group Gastroenterology Office. Thank you, Dr. Elias, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Emily. It's important to talk about these issues. What are the signs and symptoms of colon cancer that people should be aware of? Right, so unfortunately with colon cancer, at an early stage when it's detectable, many times there aren't very many symptoms. But as the cancer progresses, people can develop, and commonly we will see things like a change in their bowel pattern where they have thinning of the stools that persists. They could have rectal bleeding or blood in the stool, or sometimes they'll have issues with pain such as cramping that goes on or persists, or uh, vague symptoms such as fatigue or unintentional weight loss. Mm -hmm. Why do people get colon cancer? Are there factors you can control or is this cancer mostly hereditary? Right, like for most co cancers, including colon cancer, there are both environmental and genetic factors that contribute to, to the development of cancer. Uh, colon cancer typically occurs at an older age. Most cancers are occurring after the age of 50, but some can occur at an earlier age. There are some environmental factors that can contribute, such as diet, especially people who consume high uh, uh, diets on, on, that are meats or processed food based, especially you know, the, the processed foods. Uh, if you have a diet that's mostly with fruits and vegetables, then that tends to lower the risk. Also, if you have a sedentary life and don't exercise, that increases your risk of cancer as well. Uh, we do know also that obesity, smoking, uh, excessive alcohol use or even having other diseases such as diabetes can increase your risk. Uh, the hereditary factors are more complicated and it can include a family history of colon cancer or what we call colon polyps that are diagnosed in family members at a younger age. There are other known inherited colon cancer syndromes or people who have a background history what we call inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's disease or ulcers, ulcerative colitis are known to have increased risk as well. Okay. So what age should people start having a colonoscopy? Um, I've heard that you should start at age 50, but has that recommendation changed at all? So most colon cancers are treatable if caught at an early age, and that's why the American Cancer Society has recommended initiation of screening at age 45 for people who are what we call average risk. Those are people who don't have any of the increased factors that we talked about regarding hereditary. Um, if there is a family history of colon cancer, then usually the recommendation is people start 10 years before the age that their family member was diagnosed with colon cancer. Okay, gotcha. Um, what tests are available to detect this cancer? Um, I've seen commercials for Cologuard where you can take the test at home. Is that something that's recommended? So um, there are various tests to, to detect colon cancer. There are usually of two types. There are what we call stool-based tests that look for traces of blood. Those are called FIT tests or Cologuard that actually looks for DNA changes associated with colon polyps or colon cancer. 
So starting those at in a certain intervals can be an appropriate strategy. The gold standard still is uh, colonoscopy, which is visualization of the uh, colon lining directly with a camera. And that also affords the physician the opportunity to remove what are called precancerous or benign polyps that can lead to colon cancer. Okay. So if someone is diagnosed as having colon cancer, what treatments are available? So treatments vary. It depends. If cancer is caught at an early stage where most of the time can be curable, surgery is required to remove the cancer. And as I said, in most instances, it's completely curable. If the cancer is more advanced, then unfortunately a combination of surgery with chemotherapy or possibly radiation is needed to treat the cancer. Okay. And what would you say are the best tips for preventing colon cancer? So the tips to prevent colon cancers are really you know, so directed at those risk factors. First and foremost, you have to and should try to you know, eat right. So a, a diet that's uh, high in fruits and vegetables, uh, that is low in processed meats and uh, red meats could be helpful. Uh, trying to get it and to maintain a good uh, healthy weight is very important. Try to avoid uh, sedentary life, be active, exercise. It's, it's been known that at least 150 minutes of exercise a week spread out throughout the week can decrease the risk of many cancers, including colon cancer. And then at, at the appropriate age, at age 45, if you're at average risk and don't have other family member risks, then you should talk to your doctor about screening strategies. And there's different screening strategies that you know, your physician can help guide you with. Okay, so some of that kind of basic uh, tips for maintaining good health and then get screened at the appropriate time for your kind of risk factors. Absolutely. It is a very preventable cancer mm -hmm. if screening is implemented at, at the appropriate age. Good. Okay. So thank you for sharing this information with us. Um, now are you accepting new patients and do people need a referral to come see you? They do not need a referral to come see me and yes I'm accepting new patients and they just need to contact you know through their physician or, or Baptist uh, referral line for those recommendations. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we're talking caregiver support resources from Acts 2. Stay with us. If you're looking for a fun and exciting environment for your loved one, then LNL Executive Adult Daycare is a perfect fit. We offer social gatherings, physical activities, games, outings and daily luncheons from Karen's Catering. We take a holistic approach to social stimulation and aim to enrich the lives of our guests. Let us help restore your loved one's mind, body and soul. We'd love to speak to you. L&L Executive Adult Daycare. Big business love with small town feel. The Reesburg Institute, Pensacola's Ear, Nose, Throat and Voice Center. We welcome you to visit us at our convenient Davis Highway location in Pensacola. At the Reesburg Institute, we offer the most advanced treatment available in a calm, stress-free environment. Since 2014, we've performed over a thousand cases in Office of Balloon Sinus Surgery, as well as septoplasty and nasal procedures using oral sedation. The in-office procedures result in a faster healing time. Visit us and feel the difference. The Beacon at Gulf Breeze offers the finest senior living community in the area. We are here for your loved ones who need assisted living and advanced memory care services. Seniors will feel right at home with studio, one bedroom apartments, a large dining area, a beautiful landscape courtyard, and even a salon. With professional staff and one-on-one -on -one care, your loved ones are our top priority. Welcome to the Beacon at Gulf Breeze. Welcome home.
who has cared for a loved one with dementia knows the burden and challenges of this particular kind of caregiving. ACTS2 is an organization hoping to ease that burden through training, support, and other resources. ACTS stands for African American Alzheimer's Caregiver Training and Support, but their services are open to anyone who is in a caregiver role for a person with dementia. We've got FSU medical student and ACTS2 advisor Mandy Shazadi here today to tell us more. So thank you for joining us today, Mandy. Of course. Thank you for having me, Emily. So first of all, can you give us a basic overview of what ACTS2 offers to caregivers? Sure. Um, so like you said, the kind of overarching goal of ACTS2 is to meet the needs of distressed caregivers of those suffering from um, Alzheimer's dementia. And really, there's four types of services that can be offered by the program. Um, the first one is a faith-based skills building and support program, and this is going to include 12 different sessions on um, various topics for both the caregiver and how to um, deal with the challenges that come with that. The second is a problem-solving consultation. So this will be a little bit shorter. It's one to two sessions, and it's more directed at um, specific needs of that particular caregiver and what they're worried about. The third is the information and referral services. So um, customers or patients can, can call in and they can get um, resources about any local, statewide, or national resources that can be provided to them based on what they need. And four, we have the Dementia Awareness Training and Skills Workshops. So these are kind of one-offs, and we do them on any type of topic. The most recent one we had earlier this month was on um, nutritious eating, on a budget uh, for, for, caring, for people caring with those of dementia. And these are usually done on Facebook Live, and they're open to anybody. OK. Mm -hmm. So we know that there is significant inequity in healthcare between racial demographics, and that can extend to caregivers as well. So why is it important particularly to focus on African-American caregivers? Yeah, so the problem here is kind of twofold in a sense, in that we know dementia affects all racial groups and ethnic um, groups, but we also know that African-Americans are twice as likely to suffer from Alzheimer's dementia over uh, white counterparts. So that's a huge inequity right there in and of itself. In addition to that, we know that caregivers, um, African-American caregivers specifically, just from a cultural standpoint, tend to be more involved in caring and, and, and in that specific role um, over other groups. So they have more um, direct care, and they spend a, l a larger proportion of their income on caregiving as you know, compared to other races. And they also are more likely to suffer from their own health issues um, as it relates to um, people with dementia. So they can have things like sleep disturbances or have things like hypertension because they're being put on, in this stressful role of being a caregiver. And they're also less likely to reach out for help over other minorities just from a, um, a distrust in the medical community, perhaps. And so we really need to target those groups. Yeah. What are the qualifications that make someone eligible for the training sessions? Yeah, so it kind of varies based on which of those four services we're talking about. If we're talking about the main traditional one, um, you do need to be African American, and you do need to be a caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's dementia. And that what we use is kind of five hours per week you're spending in this caregiver role, at least. And you also need to be living in Florida. But as far as the other programs go, they're really open to anybody who's in a caregiving role, regardless of race or ethnicity. OK. Um, how do the sessions actually work once someone is enrolled in the program? Yeah, so it's pretty straightforward. Most of the services are done over the phone. So um, in the traditional 12-session program, five, five of those will be individual one-on-one -on -one phone calls with trained facilitators um, of the faith community. And then seven of them will be group ones where you're going to have um, usually three or four caregivers on the phone at the same time and working through those sessions. So there's a little bit of a group therapy aspect to it? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and this program is totally free to caregivers, correct? Entirely free, yes. Awesome. What are some of the signs of stress that a caregiver might experience as they care for a loved one with dementia or Alzheimer's? Yeah, so everyone kind of um, processes and displays stress in different ways. Mm -hmm. So not all of these apply to everybody, but really some things that you would, you would maybe see are gonna be like sleep disturbances, maybe loss of interest in things that you typically enjoyed, feeling guilty, um, irritability or agitation more so than usual. Um, maybe it's going to start affecting, you know, your eating habits and, and kind of just spills over into a lot of aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. What skills do caregivers build or strengthen as they complete this program? Yeah, so a lot of different really, really neat skills. Um, one kind of category would be just how to take on a caregiver role. So things like managing medications or how to deal with um, things like sundowning, topics that we typically see in patients who have Alzheimer's dementia. So e education on that. And then also just on, from a relationship standpoint, how to, how to maintain a good relationship with this person, how to um, effectively communicate with them and problem solve and then also focus on yourself too because that sometimes gets neglected in this caregiver role is you really need to take time to have self-care mm -hmm. and um, do the things that you enjoy. So is there anything else you'd like to let people know about Acts 2 that we haven't covered? Um, so definitely I think checking out the website is a great place to start that's acts2project.org and you can sign up um, just to get more information on there. And also there's a ton of resources um, that you can read through there on just caregiver skills. So just kind of dipping your toes through the website or through the Facebook page is a really cool way to stay connected. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing this information for caregivers with of us. Of course. Thank you. Stay tuned. We're talking about the challenges and joys of social work next. Over two decades ago, TLC Caregivers partnered with the Council on Aging of West Florida to assist seniors with non-medical help to stay independent in their own homes. Our commitment to providing these services started in 1989 and has grown to aid people from birth through geriatrics, from a short visit of two hours to 24 hours a day. We're a proud sponsor of the Council on Aging of West Florida. We're TLC Caregivers. When cancer tries to take you away from the things that matter most, Baptist Cancer Institute offers caring physicians and the most innovative treatment options. With convenient locations and a wide array of support programs and services, we're here to help you during the most difficult of times. As a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network, we're bringing even more innovative cancer care to our community right here at home. When you need cancer care, we'll be there. If you smoked, this new lung cancer screening could save your life. Visit SaveByTheScan.org. They call me Prince like I'm royalty or something. But the places I've lived ain't no palaces. So I don't need grilled salmon or a new scratching post. Just give me a cardboard box and a can of tuna and we're good. You can even change my name. I'm cool being the kitty formerly known as Prince. for them. We are here for you. Find free care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. March is National Social Work Month, and we're showcasing this role and the tremendous efforts that go into this work. If you've ever needed community assistance, help with a family member, or just needed to see what resources were available to you, chances are you worked with a social worker. We're celebrating these unsung heroes and speaking to y Yolanda DuBose about her experiences in social work. 
Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. So first of all, um, tell me a little bit about your experience and your current role as a social worker. So I've worked for the past 17 years, which just rolled around. Interesting. Um, but 17 years of working in some capacity in social services, mental health, or behavioral health. Um, I'm also a social work professor currently. Awesome. So we hear that term social work a lot, but what exactly is it? So social work is defined by the National Association of Social Workers as um, a profession that basically sets out to help pe meet people where they are. Um, it helps to problem solve, helps to um, address issues, and helps people to cope in their daily lives. Sure. Um, so describe how you advocate for your clients. So advocacy is a big part of social work. Um, it's a big part of our code of ethics. And advocacy consists of many different things. It consists of direct practice, helping clients individually. It consists of um, working with groups or communities, helping them to meet whatever their goals are or whatever the community needs are. But it also consists of administration, um, policy, and organizing to help to implement change on a larger scale. Okay, great. So a lot of a lot of different moving parts going on there. So this year's social work month theme is social work breaks barriers. What does that mean to you? I believe social workers break barriers each and every day. Usually when we meet individuals, communities, um, even when we're addressing policy or larger scale concerns, there's usually some type of challenge or barrier or obstacle along the way. Um, and I think that there are a lot of uh, nights where we stay at the office later working um, when others are home. Um, I think that there are many days where we're out working um, early in the mornings. Um, I think that we just do what we need to do to be able to advocate and help to meet our clients needs. Absolutely. What made you decide to get into this profession? Well, this may sound a little cliche, but I've always liked helping people, even from a small child. Um, but a family situation occurred while I was in college and it basically helped to um, influence me to shift and change my major from pharmacy to social work. So I was always thinking helping professional but shifted to social work due to that circumstance. Sure. So I know as a social worker you often see really challenging situations. Um, tell us about the hard days and, and how you cope with those kind of situations. Social work can definitely be challenging as I mentioned earlier, but I think it's really important for um, social workers to um, engage and speak with each other and support one another, but also be able to um, self-reflect and realize that we are humans as well and that even though we put on our superpowers um, or our, our, I guess our cape, um, we still need to make sure that we're managing and taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, tell me about, you know, the good days when you feel like you've really done something positive and, and how you reflect on those types of experiences. I think the great days always make up for the extra time and effort and energy. Um, when I say extra, it's expected. We don't, we don't talk about it. We don't brag about it. We just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that the good days make up for that tenfold. Um, and the days that we're able to accomplish our goals on a larger scale and be able to impact numerous people. Um, those that's just like icing on the cake. Good. Um, tell me a little bit about the National Association of Social Workers. Um, that's how we kind of got in touch and I know this this month they're doing some celebrations. Um, tell me about that organization. So the National Association of Social Workers is the professional agency or organization that um, that guides or uh, leads um, the profession. In other words, they are the profession that um, mandates our ethics, um, uh, all of the things that dictate our daily work. And so because our profession embodies um, a code of ethics, we're able to work towards um, effective change in an organized way. What do you think um, are some of the things people don't understand about social work and social workers? So I think social workers don't understand um, 
the various roles, I mean, people don't understand the various roles that social workers actually take on. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have social workers who are out there working in Congress. Um, I don't know that people are aware of that. If they are, that's great. If not, we want to promote more awareness mm -hmm. and make sure that um, those interested in becoming social workers know that there are so many opportunities out there, um, so many different populations of people that you can work with. Um, the profession is essentially evolving. Um, and quite frankly, if you get bored in one area, there are plenty others to explore. Mm -hmm. How is it evolving, would you say? I think it's evolving because of more awareness. Um, as you know, the pandemic occurred over the last few years, and because of that, there's been an influx in mental health um, services, um, the demand of mental health services. And because of that, I think social workers are now um, becoming more recognized and because of the recognition um, you're seeing more and more uh, job availability you're seeing more requests for engagements like this for us to come out and speak and talk to people again to continue to pro promote awareness so that people know where they can receive help exactly and you know at council on aging we have our social services department where the social workers are working with the elderly they're in hospitals they're with dcf they're working with children so um, it's really a huge variety in the in the different types of social work jobs that there are out there. Most definitely. So if someone wants to be connected with the resources you offer, how can they do that? So directly for me, you would contact my office um, by way of different contact methods. So one would be the phone number for the office, 850-331-1830. I probably should mention the office name. Um, it is One Life Counseling and Wellness. Um, it is an organization that's meant to not only provide counseling services, clinical counseling services, but also consultation, um, supervision for social workers who are up, up and coming, um, as well as case management services. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your um, experiences and thank you for the work that you do and thank you for having me again yeah and thank you for watching until next time enjoy life you've earned it mm -hmm.